Okay, Erev Tov, today is the 20, tonight is the 21st day of Shabbat. This coming Shabbos, we are Mevorchim Rosh Chodesh Adar. We bless the new month of Adar, which will be next Friday, the following Friday and Shabbos. So really a week from Shabbos is the first day of Ador. And that Shabbos, we're going to read three Sifrei Torah. So that's uh, exciting also. So I wanted to start today to learn a little bit about this idea of achieving Simcha in Ador. Okay, and it kind of follows up from last week because one of the things we mentioned in regarding of controlling your mind from Averos is to be besimcha. So we touched on that in the last, I think, 10 minutes of the class. So I want to... Uh, talk a lot about it, and we'll see how far we can go with Simcha, and then maybe the next two weeks, we'll look a little bit in the Megillah. I think we'll uh, look for that for the next two weeks, unless you have another request. Uh, we got to get into the Purim spirit. Maybe next week, we'll have some scotch at the table. You know, everybody, what? If I give you guys three or four shots of scotch, then I could say anything I want. <laughs> and, you'll, and you'll just like whatever I say. <laughs> anyway, anything, anything like okay, okay, good. Listen, we don't need the scotch for that. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Famous Gemara in Ta'anis. I should have put down the source 29A. There's 29A. Says, Kishem Shemishenichnas Av Mematim Besimcha. Just as when the month of Av begins, one decreases Simcha. When the month of Ador uh, comes in, Marbim, we, we add on, we increase Bisimcha joy. Now, just to start off with a little uh, Hasidic Shavuot, the letter Bays over here that I highlighted is big enough for you to read it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The letter Bays is not appropriate because really, when the month of Adar comes, Marbim, we increase Simcha. What's the base? Base is a preposition, but what is it pre proposing? <laughs> what we 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 add, we increase in Simcha. We don't just increase Simcha. So what's that base? Doesn't make any sense. So the uh, one of the Mephorshim says that really, if you take a look at the five words, letters, bisimcha, if you mix it around, you have a mem and a ches and a shin and a vase and a hay, it spells the word machshava, thoughts. So we, we increase to think about certain things that will help us increase the simcha. In other words, a whole year long, as we're going to look in the next source, David HaMelech says, Ivdu es Hashem b'simcha. Worship Hashem in simcha. Bo lefanav bernana. Come into his presence with shouts of joy. A Jew is supposed to serve Hashem with simcha. That's all year long you're supposed to serve Hashem with simcha. In the month of Ador, we're supposed to think of ways in our mind that we should even increase the amount of simcha. And as we mentioned last week, just to briefly repeat it, all the great curses that came to the Jews in the end of Sefer Dvarim talks about the curses. It says, Hashem It's all because you did not serve Hashem with joy and goodness of heart. So clearly we are obligated to be happy when we serve Hashem and do mitzvahs. And obviously the question we're going to look at and we're, as time allows, we'll try many different ways of answering this question. Is it possible to command someone to be happy? Can you command someone to be happy? It's easy to command a person to do mitzvahs. You could say do mitzvahs if you like it or not. Right? You have to put on tefillin. Okay, fine. Doesn't say yet. It doesn't say in the midst of tefillin you have to be happy with putting on tefillin, but we have an overall concept that your entire service of Hashem should be with simcha, which really bespeaks a larger question. Can you command a person about how he should feel? 
that's really the, the real question here. How can you command for a person to feel a certain way? But suppose if you command him to say, say his prayers with simcha, and you know, you're telling that is the way you should say, so be happy, just don't do it for doing sake. You know, be happy. I understand. I understand. That's what Hashem is telling us to do. Okay. But the fact of the matter is, doing is one thing and feeling is another. State of mind. Yeah, okay, but a state of mind, it's hard to command a person about a state of mind. Let's say the person is suffering. It's hard to be happy, right? So that's that's the thing we want to talk about. Yeah? The Torah itself is all instruction. It is telling us what to do. I understand. The Torah is telling us what to do. I understand. So I, I can see that God could command me what to do. Because I just have to do it. Okay, you want to you want to be a Jew. This is what you, you have to put on. You have to get up in the morning. You have to wash negelvas. You have to put on tefillin. You have to put on talis. You have to daven. Fine, I'll do it. But how can you make me be happy? That that's that's the real question. And and it, you see, it's so critical because the Baal Shem Tov mentions to us that for your mitzvahs really to have value, it has to have the two wings. Of love and fear. So how can you command a person how to feel a certain a lot of times, you know, we do things because we have to, and I'm not happy to do it, but I do it because I know I have to do it. Fine. For Hashem, at least we're doing it. But on top of this, we gotta be so happy. So how can you command a person to be happy? And how can you command a person about his feelings? You know, yeah, for example, the Haftalarecha Kamofcha, love your neighbor like yourself. Can you can you demand that a person should love another person? I, I don't love him. You know, he, he hurt my feelings. How can I love him? So this is a very difficult question. So how do so how are we gonna come to having this simcha for mitzvahs? And see, if it, the point is if I don't have to be happy then, you know, at least God's leaving me alone. There's two points to this question we have to really think about over here. The one point, Hashem is saying, I, it's important that you serve me out of joy. And if you don't, it's, it's, it's limiting your service to me. In other words, Hashem is saying, not only you have to do the mitzvahs, but you have to do them with joy also. That's another point of the mitzvah. And that's as if Hashem is saying, and if you don't, you're not serving me properly. That's really hard. It's hard enough to do mitzvahs. Let alone that I have to be happy doing the mitzvahs. You know, let's say you're in a court case and you have to follow the law. There's a jurisprudence. We're learning that that this week's parsha, they set up judges. You have to take, it's a mitzvah to go to court and settle a monetary dispute. Okay, let's say the judge says you lose. And you have to pay money. And you for sure thought you won. You don't have to pay. Now you have to do the mitzvah. Okay, go do. I'm going to pay. Fine. You're saying to be happy doing that mitzvah? I'm not happy. At least I, I'm doing it. Be happy. God, you should be happy I'm doing it. Why don't we do it with a smile too? So like, that's very hard to do. And on the other end, we're, we're saying, and, but there's another point that the fact of the matter is, but Hashem wants us to be happy. Forget, forget about, pretend it wasn't a mitzvah. Pretend there's no mitzvah to be happy. Wouldn't you rather be happy? <laughs> and the question is, so what's holding us back? And that's what I want to talk about tonight. Yes? So what if a person is doing uh, mitzvah or tshuva out of fear? What happens then? Uh, it's, if you do tshuva out of fear, it's still worth something. But it's still not. But the point is, Hashem wants you to be happy. He wants you to do tshuva out of love. And the tshuva should be with a certain degree of simcha. So where, where is Hashem? And, and let's just say it's simple. You know a lot of people. You guys know a lot of people. You know people at work, right? How many people, honestly, I don't, in order to tell me names, I'm not interested. People you meet, how many people you meet in the course of a day? Around. Hundreds. Wow, that's more than I meet. <laughs> How many people do you meet? When I go to office. When I go to yeah, yeah. Office. I'm saying, how many people do you meet? 50, 60. A lot? 50, 60. 50, 60. Not too many. Okay. Okay. 
So what percent would you say that of these people are genuinely happy? Zero. 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 No, no, I would say zero. Maybe I would say about five percent. Five percent. Okay, good. Okay. So that means most people aren't happy. And I, you know, I don't know if you know if any of those people are Jews, but uh, I know a lot of Jews who aren't happy. Now let's on top of that, let's put COVID into this. Even before COVID, people weren't happy. Now COVID, I don't think people are happier <laughs> that there's COVID. So how can Hashem do this? So let's look at some possibilities. And let's, uh, instead of building up like a Parsha class, we build up question after question. Let's just say the point, say the answer and develop it. So we get it straight. So one answer is the only way you can be happy is if you love Hashem. If you love Hashem, through loving Hashem, that's point seven, you can achieve simcha, I don't know where the A got jumped over there, simcha in serving Hashem. Now that makes sense. Why? Because if you love someone, you are happy doing something for someone that you love. That we already understand. Now, this is going to be one approach. As time allows, three or four approaches. But we're going to work on this approach now. If you really love Hashem, then you can understand why it's a pleasure for you to serve someone that you love. That's pretty good. Now, that only leads to the next question, though. How am I going to love Hashem? And that becomes... The question, so you tell me, okay, so now I, I'm going to love Hashem. Okay, so I'm going to love Hashem. Yeah, okay, I agree. If I really love Hashem and I'm doing mitzvahs for Hashem, then I love doing mitzvahs. You know, you know, when a person loves his sp their spouse, if you really love the spouse, then you love doing things for them. Right? So Hashem is our spouse, so to speak. So you will love doing it. So how can you love Hashem? So the key is you have to have, point number eight, the correct perspective. So let me share with you a few stories to help develop this point over here. And this first section is brought to you uh, by Rav Moshe Friedman, who's a rabbi in Eretz Yisrael. And I'm using the Sefer Doresh Tov that has beautiful, beautiful, this this uh, this rabbi is uh, he uh, is an editor, so to speak, and this is all on Purim. It's one book on yes, on every holiday, and I've done a few things over the years, but I haven't really done a lot on Simcha. So we're going to focus on the Simcha. So he tells a story that happened with him. So uh, so so there's a, a, a Jew, a Talmud Chacham, who lived in Bnei Brak, and he would daven every morning in the big shul on Rehov Rabbi Akiva. And, uh, and right next to the shul is a cigar or cigarette, uh, a cigar factory, which is called Dubuk. That's what it's called. And every man morning, this fellow would go to David and he'd see one guy would come to shul in his talus and villain. He's got his talus and villain on. He puts it on in the hallway, whatever. But before he go into the shul, he go into the cigar factory every day. So this guy's watching him every day. He puts on his hospital and he goes into the cigar factory. So this other Jew said, what is he doing going into the cigar factory? He's already got his talus and filling on. He's going to the cigar factory. What's so important? He has to go into that factory. And he said the question really was bothering this fellow because we weren't talking about just Stam, a guy who's, you know, not so religious or whatever. But the guy really is a very firm guy, a God-fearing fellow. He loves Hashem. He's a firm guy. This is so unusual why he's going to his job. So, so the other person, so he says, one day I couldn't hold myself anymore. I went to the guy. And with lots of, you know, saying, I'm really sorry, but, you know, tislachli, forgive me. But 
you know, before you daven, you're not supposed to do anything else. Why do you go to the cigar factory? So he said like this. So I'll tell you why I go to the cigar factory every day. In the factory, there's like a, a switchboard. You know, somebody is the, what do you call it? The operator. operator. It's a switchboard. The person who runs the switchboard is blind. And now when you get a call, you've got to be able to punch the right buttons, you know, to take the call to this uh, account number, this, this uh, whatever, this extension, that extension. And uh, I imagine it's very hard for that guy to do that. He can't see. So I take a good look at all those uh, buttons that have to be pushed. And when I take a good long look at it, I say, Baruch HaTo Hashem Elokeinu Melech Elam Pokeach Ivri. Blessed are you, God, that you open up the eyes of the blind. In other words, he's saying, this is how I can have better kavona in my davening. For me to appreciate that I'm not blind. And to thank Hashem for it. So I, I need to go there. I just say it regularly. That's one thing. But when I go and see the place where the guy was blind and it's so hard for him to do it, and I can Baruch Hashem see it, so I've got to do this. So that's uh, that's that's the first point. The first point. Second point. So that's so that's story number one. So first of all, you have to appreciate what Hashem does for you, and that's what we talked about last Wednesday night at the. Uh, at the at the Tubishvat party that unfortunately did not get recorded got recorded but it didn't get the video so only people who can read lips were able to understand that but we talked about the idea of the the fruit on the tree right. and to appreciate what Hashem does for you so let's let's talk about another story and this happened with Rav Friedman himself and there happened to be a person in his congregation in Eretz Yisrael who had a very very difficult type of brain cancer. And the doctors in the Rambam hospital said there's no way they could treat him. And he has to go to New York. He has to go to a special hospital in Manhattan to have a very, very complicated surgery. Now this guy was married with six kids. His wife can't go with him. His kids are little. There's nobody to go with him. He's an Israeli. He doesn't speak English. You need someone to go. So they asked the rabbi, Rav Freeman, you know, please, can you go with him? He, he, you cannot send him alone. There's nobody to go with him. So he goes to New York with this sick fellow. His name is Dunny. And, uh, you know, he had, he had to worry about all the uh, doctor's uh, uh, visits, all the things that it's very, very hard. A person comes from here, it's just a as a stranger. It's a big, big, strange country. Anyway, so they meet with the doctor's. And the surgery is scheduled for a Monday. And they said four days before, on Friday, he has to take a very difficult test. He doesn't talk about the nature. They just call it a bedika achsaris, a cruel test. I mean, a very invasive procedure to know if he can even get the surgery. And they said that this procedure, this test, is going to be more painful than the surgery. Because the surgery, you're out. Yeah. This guy's up, and it was like mamish. It was a difficult uh, to see if he could get the surgery on Monday. Anyway, they they take him in for this uh, pre-op, whatever he has to do, and mamish. This guy is in the most pain, and they finally he comes out of that test and all that. They bring him back to his room, which is on the seventeenth floor of the hospital. And you could look, this guy is like, he's, he's wiped out. He's like, and they put him in his bed, he's wiped out. The doctor says to Rev Friedman, he says, listen, I got to tell you the following. Right now, for the next 24 hours, the patient cannot move at all. He has all kinds of, uh, we had to make a lot of um, openings in his body, test a lot of things. There's a lot of bleeding going on. You got to make sure he doesn't move, doesn't take his head off the pillow. He could hemorrhage, God forbid. You're the fellow with him here. You got to make sure that he does not move for 24 hours. Okay, they gave him a special thing to give him to drink without him having to pick up his head 
the whole thing. He just cannot move the next 24 hours. So the rabbi says, okay, Donny, the doctor said you can't move. I'm, I'm here. Don't worry. I'm going to take care of you. I'm not going anywhere. All is going to be fine. Remember, it's Friday. He says, you know what? Just give me 20 minutes. I'm going to go to a corner grocery store, get some grape juice, a little challah, a little food. I'll be back in 20 minutes. Don't worry. Everything's going to be fine. Good. He goes out for 20 minutes, comes back. He brings all the stuff and uh, has little challahs and this and that. And he, he davens mincha with him in, the, in his room. He does Kabbalah Shabbos with him in the room. He davens Marav with him in the room. And then uh, they're, they're, they're going to make Kiddush in a minute. He's singing Esha Schail. He's trying to get his spirits up. He takes out a plastic cup. He's just about ready to make Kiddush. All of a sudden, two big, big orderlies come busting into the room and they start to take the, the patient. And the rabbi said, what are you doing? What are you doing? And these guys are talking fast and he's an, he's an Israeli, so he barely understands English. He's trying to say he can't be moved. He can't be moved. He, they say, no, no, he has to take a, a what do you call it? Uh, another, um, uh, what do you call those? Uh, x-ray. Let's take an x-ray. We have to have an x-ray. It's important. But the doctor said he can't move. Anyway, he, he, he can't. He, he, he's, so they just, they take him off of that. They put him in another type of bed on wheels. And they're moving him around like he's a doll. And <laughs> what's going on? And they take him down, down 17 flights. And it's now Shabbos. And the rabbi says, I can't leave him alone. Okay, I'll have to go into the elevator. And they go all the way down 17 flights, switch out, go out of one elevator, go into another elevator, go into the two floors down into the basement. And they wheel him down and they put him in the a line for the x-rays and it's a big line. And everybody's got somebody next to them, you know, some a caregiver. And he's with his fellow. And he just says, I don't know what's been going on, but he has to take a test. Okay, fine. So as we're coming down, the rabbi took a chumash with him. And he says to his friend, Dunny, it looks like we're going to be waiting for a long time. So uh, he finds himself a little chair. He says, let's, let's go over the Parsha. Let's go over the Parsha. We have a long time to go over the Parsha. Okay. So that's fine. About three minutes later, another patient is wheeled in right behind them. An old, old lady. An orderly brings her in and leaves and doesn't leave anybody with this lady. And... Uh, so the lady's like alone, she's scared, and she kind of extends her hand out a little bit. So the rabbi, okay, it's a lady, but she's very sick. So the rabbi comes over to her, and she doesn't look religious at all. She says to him, good Shabbos. Whoa. Says, good Shabbos. So he turns to his friend, Donny. He says, you know, this is a Jewish woman. He even knows it's Shabbos. She even said, good Shabbos. So Dunny, who's a, who's a wreck, he's a wreck, like he's my promise. He just post that test and he's promise. So Dunny says, you know, maybe Rabbi, do me a favor, go back up to our room, bring some grape juice and a plastic cup and make Kiddush. We didn't make Kiddush yet. And I'm sure this lady hasn't heard Kiddush today. Mm. So the rabbi thinks for a minute, he says, I'm going to go up 17 flights. I, I, don't, I don't know this rabbi, but I imagine he's probably not in the best shape. Okay, I, I would assume most rabbis are not in the best shape, but that's besides the point. He says, I have to go up, and probably it's going to be involving some kind of Hillel Shabbos. When you're in these big hospitals, it's almost impossible not to do it. some kind of Hillel Shabbos to go up these 17 flights to try to minimize it. But then he remembered the doctor said it's very important that Donnie doesn't get nervous because his blood pressure can shoot right up and that would mess up everything. So the rabbi thinks and he says, okay, he wants me. He really, he kind of said, do we really have to? No, no, I, I, come on, she's not going to hear it. And he was getting a little agitated. So, okay, okay, I'm going to do it. And the rabbi says, so now there's no way they can go regular, the regular elevators. He can't take the elevator. So what is he going to take? He has to take the emergency stairs. That's by the outside fire escape. That's the only way he can avoid. I don't know the details, but that's the story. 
So now he has to wait, first of all, to get out of the hospital. He has to wait for somebody to oh. uh, uh, go into the door, opens up. He goes outside, and now it's like it's in it's in uh, like December. It's freezing. Mm-hmm. He didn't have his coat on because they were in the hospital. He just has his, like like this, and now he's trying to climb these seventeen floors. So he's climbing up, and you know after the first floor, second floor, third floor, every floor is like a big big job. Finally, finally, he gets to the 17th floor. He opened, but, but the problem is he can't, he can't go open the door without setting off uh, a light or something. So what's he going to do now? So he prays the guy, says, Rabbi Nishalom, you sent me all the way up here. Now I'm going to be stuck. And it's freezing. It's freezing. So for some strange reason, somebody opened the door because they thought it was an entrance to the bathroom. <laughs> and he just went out right away. He went in. Make a long story short, he gets to the he gets to the room. There was a lot of other things that went on. And first he collapses on the bed for five minutes because he's from a shot of prayer. Okay, he collects everything up. He collects everything up. And now he's going down 17 flights. Okay. And he describes all the difficulties he has again to go down the flights and not to be Michal Shabbos, this and that, all the things. And he goes down the 17 flights and it's freezing close, but at least going down is a little bit easier. Finally, after a long story, he's back with the wine and the cup. And guess what? The line hardly moved. Oh, so Dunny's so happy. He brought the wine, he brought the grape juice. He says, okay, I'm going to make kiddush for everybody. It's in New York. It's in Manhattan. <laughs> in a basement. In a hospital. He makes kiddush. She says, amen. And she's like really frail. And the rabbi takes a little wine and puts it on her lips so she could just drink a little bit of wine. And the woman says, thank you. Very hard for her to speak. She's like very sick. He says, it's been 50 years since I heard Kiddush. The Germans came into my city and we had to run from one uh, stall to another stall. And after she tells the whole story and her family gets killed out and she, she finally makes it to America. She says, thank you so much. And the rabbi said, wow. He felt very moved by that. And he felt much more moved when an hour later, this woman died. This woman died. So now this Rick Friedman, he says, he says to Hashem, he says, Rabbi Nisholeilam, I traveled traveled 12,000 kilometers to go to Eretz Yisrael, to bring merit to a Jewish woman, to say, Amen. After 50 years that she didn't hear Kiddush. And he says, you cannot describe the waves of Simcha that came over me. That I succeeded to have a woman say, Amen. Right before she died. Wow. But let's more to this. More to this. So this comes the next story now. The next story took place with the altar of Kelm, Reb Simcha Zissel Ziv. This was back in Europe, like uh, more than 100 years ago. It was the night of Shavuos. And the Bach and the Yeshiva are going to be learning Torah the whole night. So he wants to give them a little bit of inspiration before they learn. And he says, my dear boys, Hashem created a very big world. Do you know, he first says, that the circumference of planet Earth is more than 40,000 kilometers. The circumference of planet Earth. Between Hashem and the stars, or rather, between the Earth and the stars are so many light years between the Earth and the stars. 
and millions of millions of kilometers beyond what we can understand. We can't even understand these distances. And Hashem created the, the biggest universe possible. And it was worthwhile for Hashem to create this whole universe that if during once, during the 6,000 years, a Jew would say one time, Baruch Hu Baruch Shemo. It's worth it for Hashem to create this big world. Just to have a Jew recognize God like that. And then the altar continued and said, and, and a thousand Baruch Hu Baruch Shemos don't equal one Amen. And one Amen does not, and a thousand Amens does not equal one Yehei Shmei Rabba Mivarach Leolam Leomel Mayo. And a thousand Yehei Shmei Rabba Mivarachs don't even equal one minute of learning Torah. So that's what he's saying to appreciate what you have on Shavuos night. So now we can understand, now that we understand all this, so the point is, point 12, you should have a tremendous amount of satisfaction knowing what you can accomplish with your avoda Hashem. What we achieve, which we mentioned also last week, that you know everything we do does all kinds of things in the universe. So therefore, we should have a great simcha in knowing how much we accomplish in this world through our Torah mitzvahs. If we only knew the value of one amen, of one minute of learning Torah, you should be overjoyed if you realize what is it that we are doing and how special it is to HaKadosh Baruch Hu. And that should bring us to a great love of Hashem. But then, of course, comes the next question. Yeah, okay, I get that. Okay, I understand. So you're telling me if I, with everything I do, every missile, you should be really happy with that. That the whole world is worth it for my one Baruch Hu Baruch Shemo. And thousands of times more for Amen and learning Torah and doing mitzvahs. Unbelievable what I accomplish. But, but what about all the suffering in life? How do I contend with all that tsar? So, the answer to that is, you know, sometimes a husband comes home from a hard day of work and uh, he's really hungry and he's thinking it's going to be a good meal. And then the wife says, look, I'm really sorry, dear, I was preparing supper and the power went out for an hour and a half and I couldn't prepare any supper for you. Okay, so you're a bit disappointed. Okay, look what's... Just take a bagel, put a little peanut butter and jelly. Nope. You, you, you do that. Uh, the next day you come home from supper and this time the gas in the stove went out. She couldn't cook supper. So make another bagel, whatever. Third day, everything was working, but your wife, she burnt the meal. You ever have, the, you ever have burnt meatballs, guys? <laughs> you ever have burnt meatballs? Nope. I've had it a few times. <laughs> it happens. It happens. You know, what can you do? You know, our, our, our tremendous wives, they do so many mitzvahs, especially when they're doing supper, because supper is not so exciting. So doing a lot, making shaduch and this and that. And sometimes you forget it. You walk in the house, <laughs> burnt meatballs. Okay. I guess could have another bagel and uh, cream cheese. Now, this is already third day already. It's getting to be a little bit annoying at this point because you're working hard and you want to have a good supper. Meanwhile, that, not, then the phone rings. Phone rings and they said, hello, is this Mr. so -and -so? Yes. I'm calling from the Ontario Gaming Commission. Mm -hmm. Just want you to know you won the Powerball. $50 million. So first you say, it's probably a joke. Stop joking with me. You hang up and you call back and say, you wait to see what they say. Ontario Gaming Commission. Oh, I guess it's the right one. And now they tell you, you got $50 million. I want to ask you, are you upset that the meatballs burnt? No. Why not? <laughs> you were upset five minutes ago. Now, the, your response five minutes ago, I didn't say what the husband said to the wife the whole time here. Yeah. 
It depends on the husband. Some husbands will yell and scream at the wives. Others will suffer in silence. Some even beat their wives. I don't know. I'm not suggesting. But one thing's for sure. He found out he won the lottery. Forget it. It doesn't make any difference. Because great joy dwarfs all other suffering. So imagine whatever suffering we go through in our lives. And remember, we've done much more than won the lottery. Every day you're doing mitzvahs, it's incredible what, what you are gaining from all this. So if we understand that whatever suffering we have, it has to pale in significance to that. And now let's take it another step further another step further. And it's something that is connected to what we spoke about last week, if you recall, just from the Parsha class. We know that when the snake seduced Adam and Chava to sin, Hashem punished them all and he punished the snake. What was the punishment of the snake? He would eat the dust. He would eat the dust. And the commentators all ask, what kind of punishment is that? Wherever he goes, there's food. What, wherever he goes, he never has to worry about not having a meal. Do you call that a curse? So the commentaries say it is. You know why? Because if he has all the food he needs, he doesn't need Hashem. And therefore, he doesn't have any relationship with a Kurdish Baruch. Okay. The opposite, the biggest blessing is to have a total re relationship with Hashem for everything. For example, the Jewish people, they left Egypt, right? They were in Egypt for 210 years and some of it was very, very difficult times. And they leave Egypt and they come by the sea and as we mentioned last week, they are trapped. And the Medrash, I just briefly referred to it, but now we'll look a little bit more. I'll do this fast because we did talk about last week. It says when the Jewish people, they left Mitzrayim, what were they like? It's on a pasuk in Shira Shirin that says, my dove is in the cleft of the rock of the mountain. So Yona Shaborcha Mithanates, a dove is running away from the eagle. The eagle's trying to kill the dove. And came into a little crack in the mountain, to hide in the little cleft of the mountain. But guess what she found in the back of that cleft? He sees there's a snake hissing, ready to bite him. The hawk chases him into the little corner into there, and in the back of that corner is a snake who wants to bite him. So now, as they say, he's between a rock and a hard place. If he goes out, the eagle's going to kill him. He goes further in, the snake's going to kill him. So he can't do anything. So what did it do? It starts flapping its wings. He hopes his owner will notice where he is and will come and save him because there's nothing else he could do. So was the Jewish people. There was nowhere they could go. And what happens? It says they all cried out to Hashem. And at that point, Hashem saved them. So the question is, why did Hashem bring him to this point in time? Why does he have to hear them again? But of course, we understand the answer. The answer is because Hashem loves to hear our prayers. To him. Not that Hashem is egotistical, but Hashem wants to teach us that they have. we have a father that loves us and will always be there for us. That's the whole point. The whole point that we have challenges in life is to know that as we said last week, Hashem says, you just call out my name and you know wherever I am, I'll come running. And Hashem has to create these situations so we remember that. Because often when life is good, we forget all about Hashem. And we become like the snake. And the snake says, I don't need Hashem. But to realize, no, no, that you have someone who really loves you and wants to show you how much they love you. And therefore, really, a lot of times when we pray, we pray for a lot of things. We pray for all kinds of redemptions. We pray to have nachas from our kids. We pray that the corona should end. But you know what's another thing to pray for? 
You should pray to Hashem that we remember to praise Hashem for all his kindnesses. That's such an important thing to remember. As we say in the uh, Nishmas Kochai prayer, that no matter what we would praise to Hashem, there's no way we could thank Hashem sufficiently. So, so the point is, if we understand what Hashem is giving us, as Jews especially, we have the ability to, to create the greatest success for ourselves in our lives at no charge. And Hashem is always there for us. And whatever suffering we have is only so we should feel this love that Hashem has for us. There's no way that we should feel sad except having, but you got to think about these things. You got to think about these things. Now, what makes them so hard to think about? And this is the challenge we have to overcome. The Gemara Bracha says like this, Chana was barren for many years. She finally had a child, Shmuel, and she sang a song out to Hashem. And one of the lines is, Ain't sur kelo kenu. There's no rock like our God. And the Gemara says, well, really read it like this. Ain't sayor kelo kenu. There's no painter. There's no artist like our God. So the question is, is that all Chana can praise Hashem for? That he's a great painter. So they give the following marshal, the following analogy, is that there once was a great contest between artists to see who could draw the best painting. And after many uh, contests, it was brought down to the finals. Two guys are left. And they're given a week to work, and they're going to present it in the Grand Auditorium. And you got, they're working hard for a week, whatever, and you have painter A has got his painter behind a curtain, and painter B has his portrait behind the other curtain. So painter A is told to go first. He moves away the curtain, and he drew a tree that was like so beautiful, it was so lifelike. With fruits, it was babish. All of a sudden, there were real birds came in. And they came in and they banged into the tree by the apples. That Mamish thought it was, it was a real tree. It was so lifelike. And they're all clapping. Oh, that's amazing. That's amazing. Whoa, we never saw a picture like that before. And when it calms down, they turn to paint the V. Paper says, no, forget it. I don't even want to show it. It's forget it. I, there's no way I'm going to win. I give up already. Just give him the prize. I say, come on. You came all the way here. You already went to the quarterfinals, semifinals, this and that. Just, just show it to us. I can't. I can't. I'm sorry. I'm not going to show this. So the judges are getting upset. Just move the curtain already. I'm not going to do it. If you're going to do it, you move the curtain. Okay, we'll move the curtain. And they go to the curtain. They can't move it. Because the painting was the curtain. Was the curtain. Wow. So the judges have to convene to decide who the winner is. So they convene and they say the winner is painter B. You know why? Because painter A was able to fool the birds, but painter B was able to fool the judges. And that's even a bigger thing. So what does it mean that Hashem, there's no artist like Hashem? Let's figure a person, let's say, like Hana, a woman who couldn't have children. And now she has children, Baruch Hashem, it goes to Shalom. Okay, after so many years, imagine, try to imagine what it would be to not have children for so many years. And you go to a fertility clinic and their mom should spend a lot of time with you. So, of course, what she's going to do, she's going to give a gift to the lady who helped her, the midwife. She's going to give a, a, a nice gift to the doctor and probably a good check also to the doctor. But what you could forget is, where's Hashem? So Hashem is hiding inside the picture. And you got to realize who really brought the salvation. So that's what it meant. Chana understood that as much as it was a great thing, and there were many people to thank, she understood that Hashem is such a great painter. You don't even see Hashem in the picture. That's how good of a painter he is. 
And the reason Hashem does that is so that we have free will choice. That's the point, that free will choice. So therefore, if we would just think about this painting and that we have to see, and this is all as well, as this all unfolds, where does this all lead us to? It's going to lead us to Megillah's Esther. Because again, the whole story of the Megillah is that Hashem is concealed. And to be able to, you have to be smart enough. You have to have machshava, the right thoughts to understand where Hashem fits into all this. And if you see on the one hand that look what the mitzvahs do for us, how much we get accomplished with a mitzvah, to know that should give us so much joy. And any suffering pales in insignificance when you know every mitzvah is winning the lottery. It's like winning the lottery. So why, why would that bother you? And, and if you're having any suffering, it pales. And whatever you see, it's because Hashem, and any suffering says to Hashem, we should call out to Hashem and know we have a relationship with Hashem. And he's always there to answer us and to listen to us. And the fact you don't see it is only because he's such a good painter. If you have all these machshavos, we would come to loving Hashem. And once you love Hashem, that he's, Hashem's giving you, like every day you can crank out millions of dollars of schar just by doing that. And nobody could stop you. It's not like a business. You work hard and you could not make a penny. Here you guaranteed returns on your, uh, on your res results on your re and returns. So how could you not be happy when you're doing a mitzvah? And you do a mitzvah, you help somebody out and then he turns on you and stabs you in the back. Didn't take away from the mitzvah. Why do we let these things disturb us? So we're in the middle of a corona. Yeah, it's terrible. Yeah, but Lemaisa, we still can do mitzvahs. And the mitzvahs are even harder. You got masks on. So you imagine when you do a mitzvah with more difficulty, besides the thousand times more, it's even another thousand times. So instead of complaining that we have to do this, we have to do this, we have to sign up, all the things we have to do, it's just adding on to the schar. And if we didn't have corona, we would just get regular schar. So that's the first main point that I think is if we would just stop and think about these things, we're going to have marv in 20 minutes. To imagine when you're just dabbling one marv, how much you get for this. It's okay. And if you finish marv and if, God forbid, you get a flat tire on the way home, I don't wish it on anybody. How could you be upset when you just won the lottery again and again and again? So that's point number one. Point number two, that will also deal with uh, challenges in life and focusing on when things don't seem to work so well. So there's an interesting question. We know the Talmud says the following. The Talmud says, you know, just like when you get ready for Purim, there's certain things you got to get ready for Purim. Purim comes, you just can't walk into Purim happy or ready. You got to buy things. You got to this. It's only, every mitzvah needs preparation. So the mitzvah of simcha needs preparation too. And the big preparation is simcha, but you have to work on having simcha. Now there's a statement in the Gemara that says like this, for a Navi to have prophecy, he can only have prophecy if he is happy. If the prophet is not happy, he cannot give prophecy. So they ask a wonderful question. The prophet Jeremiah, he composed the book of Lamentations, Echa. Now, there isn't a sadder book in the world. The visions that he sees of, of women cooking their children, eating their children, women who normally are Rachmonios, they're eating their kids, the suffering that's going on up there. The question is, the book of Jeremiah and these prophecies in Echa, how could he, he did it with prophecy? How could you have prophecy? How could you be happy when you're prophesizing such terrible things? Isn't that a great question? How can you prophesize? This is terrible what he's writing about. Similar to Zalacha, you remember in Gemara and Brachas, the Mishnah says, just like you make a bracha for something good with joy, you have to make a bracha for something bad, Dayan Ames, with joy. Again, how could you make a bracha, Diana Mess, with, with joy? Okay, so we had one answer from the first part of the class. Now we're going to offer you 
Another answer that is brought to you by Reb Meir Simrot. And he says a very interesting idea. He says like this. The Pasuk says, another Pasuk about Simcha. We started with, first we started this one. You have to serve Hashem with joy. So we explained how the service of Hashem itself should give you joy. That's winning the jackpot. Now we're going to look at another Pasuk that deals with joy. And it says, Pikude Hashem Yesharim. The precepts of the Lord are just. Misam they give joy to the heart. Mitzvahs Hashem bara miris The mitzvahs of the Hashem are clear. They make the eyes light up. So what is he saying? The Pusik seems to say, what is really Pikud Hashem? God's mitzvahs. Torah mitzvahs Hashem are straight and they make people happy. So what is that saying? It's telling me that learning Torah is a key to happiness. Now, all the people that you know that are not happy, how much Torah do they learn? <laughs> how about Jews that are not happy? How much Torah do they learn? So now we have a very interesting concept here. Very interesting that you have to think about. You're gonna, we're going to show you a few proofs that Simcha is a product of taking two opposites and putting them together. You see, we'll show it in a minute, that every time it brings a tremendous amount of joy. When two opposites come together. What's the most obvious example? Marriage. Marriage. The prophet Yeshaya says, um sois al like a chosen rejoices with a kala, your God rejoices, you can rejoice with Hashem. So what's an expression of the greatest joy is a chosen and a kala. Now what's the great joy? Well, let's look, the chosen by himself cannot build a Jewish home. A kala by herself cannot build a Jewish home. What builds the Jewish home? The chassan and kala together. That's why the Torah says God created male and female. Female, he created them and he called them Adam. Only a zahar, a male and a female fit the puzzle together and turns the person into an Adam. A new reality. A new concept. And that is what keeps a house of Israel on its feet. Now, what do you know clearly about a man and a woman? You're not going to find two bigger opposites. Totally. In every way possible, men and women are different. Now, what's the Torah saying? What's the Navi saying? What's Yeshaya saying? When the two opposites get together, they create a perfection. And that brings the joy of Mesos Chasan al the joy of a Chasan al There is a tremendous joy that when you, when you with yourself, you feel you're missing something. And the other person feels the missing. I'm missing something, and she has it. And she says, I miss something, and he has it. But you know what? That other person is going to be so different than me. And there's going to be challenges, but over time, what's going to happen is we're going to feel completed because what I miss who she has. And the Navi says that's the greatest joy. And the truth is, when you see good marriages, that is the greatest joy, even though they're two opposites. When two opposites forge one entity, that is joy. Let's give another example. How about another two opposites? The heavens and the earth. Two opposites. The heavens belong to Hashem. The earth belongs to man. The Medrash says that uh, 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 the Medrash says a goy once asked for Bishuva and Korcha. Is it possible that the Jews and non-Jews can be happy together? When the Jews are having their holidays, the goyim don't. 
when the government have their holidays, we don't. So, you know, it's, it's, it's asked, is there any day that the Jew and the non-Jew could both be happy on the same day? She said, I'll tell you when, when it rains. When it rains, everybody's happy. Why? Think about it. Think about what happens when it rains. What are you combining? Heaven and earth. Heaven and earth. Two opposites are combining. They're touching each other. And that brings great simcha. Rain is that which combines the heavens and the earth together. Okay, now let's look at the two biggest opposites of all in, on the entire planet Earth. What would you say are the two biggest opposites in the entire planet? The whole created world. What are the two biggest opposites? Yes, physical and spiritual, body and soul. As Masil Sharm says, that the two of them totally are not compatible with each other. The soul is lofty. He compares it to a, a peasant marrying a princess. He says the peasant can never make the princess happy because whatever the peasant gives, he, he has no idea what the, what the princess is used to having. A body can never make a soul happy because whatever the body thinks is important, the soul is disgusted with it. The apostle says you can never satisfy, a body can never satisfy a soul. So because the soul is a spiritual entity. So the body says, here, have some, uh, have some pizza. And the soul says, I'm not interested in pizza. They are total opposites. Total opposites. The Ben Ishka says an amazing thing. Why do we greet everybody with Shabbat Shalom? Why do we say Shabbat Shalom? The answer is Shabbat is the day that makes Shalom between the body and the soul. A whole week long, they, they're having trouble getting along with each other. The body's saying, let's have a good time. Let's watch Netflix. The soul's saying, let's go to the Chumash class. What are we going to do? Okay, you try to make some compromise, you know? And when the body's happy, the soul's just waiting. When am I going to get to have something fun? And when the soul's ha happy, the body say, when am I going to have something? Right? Then, then, then there's no pleasure going. But on Shabbos, the soul benefits and is happy with us eating food on Shabbos because that's a mitzvah. And the body's for sure happy with the food. So Shabbos creates the shalom, Shabbat shalom, between the body and the soul. They both partner in the Sudat Shabbat, the Shabbos meal with the Zmiros and the singing and the gratitude to Hashem, everybody's happy. There's no two greater opposites than the body and the soul, physicality and spirituality. The body's full of physical desires. The soul is full of spiritual desires. Question, besides Shabbos, how do these two merge together? And let's even ask better, if it's the body and soul, how does man and God merge to? How does it happen? What is that glue? What it is? Torah. The Torah is the glue that connects the body and the soul together. As the Zohar says, where did I put it there? Hashem, the Torah, and Yisrael are one. Because when a Jew is learning Torah with physically, and the Torah talks about physical things, you're talking about an ox that gores a, another ox. You're talking about physical things. But there's a Torah that gives us a spiritual way of looking at it. So the human being is able to connect with HaKadosh Baruch Hu. And that learning itself puts the two together. And therefore, that's what we're saying. That Hashem has created us in a way, if we follow the Torah mitzvahs, we're able to take our bodies and our souls and our entities and a Kaddish Baruch Hu that are exact opposites and have the pleasure of connecting with something and perfecting something with the use of the opposites. And that is a true simcha. The true simcha of learning Torah and the mitzvahs that we do is what gives us the simcha of being connected with Hashem. And that's what the Pasuk is saying. Pekude Hashem, the mitzvahs of Hashem, Yeshorim, they are straight. Misam Chelev. 
it gives joy to his heart. It gives him joy because that's what connects him to Hashem. So therefore, if we're looking for ways to be happy, besides appreciating how much Hashem loves you, the greatest way to feel that connection is by learning Hashem's Torah. People who learn Torah, and you learn Torah lishma for the sake of learning Torah, and you feel your, your body is connecting to a higher reality, that gives you a great simcha. That's the greatest shidduch you could have, that you're connected to the infinite. There's an interesting story. Oh, so that's the conclusion, so to speak, that true joy is achieved when a person unifies with a channel. When something so physical can connect with something so spiritual through the means of the Torah, that's it. So let's go back to the question. How is the Navi, how is the Navi able to be happy when he's prophesizing gloom and doom about the Jewish people? And the answer is because the, the prophecy itself, the message he has to give over is through the connection to Hashem. He first has the connection to Hashem. Once you have the connection to Hashem, the content is irrelevant. When you have that connect, you first have the simcha. When you have the simcha, you have Hashem, it doesn't matter what Hashem is telling you to say. Because you have that incredible joy of connecting with Hashem. They tell a story with Rabbi Yisrael Salanter, the father of the Musr movement. It was on a Purim. He stuck out his hand and he said to his students, you know, the Gemara says, on Purim, anyone who sticks his hand out, you have to give him. The simple meaning is, he sticks his hand out for tzedakah, and he gives it to him. So I'm taking out my hand, and I'm ready to pray for you. Tell me what you want, and I'll pray for you. Stick your hand out. Ask me what, what I should pray for, and I will pray for you. Wow, it's a great deal. So one of his great students, Reb Naftali, Amsterdam. He said, Rebbe, this is my wish for Purim. Can you pray for me for this? I would like to have the head of Rabbi Akiva Eger, who was the smartest Jew of the generation. I would like to have the heart of a certain rabbi, the author of the Sefer, Yesod Bishar Shavoda, who was a very spiritual person. And I want the Midos, your Midos. I want your character. So if your soul said, you know what? You know what Hashem wants from you, Rabbi Naftali? He wants with your head and your heart and your midos to be Naftali. He doesn't want Naftali to have the head of Rabbi Akiva Eger. He doesn't want you to have the heart of this other rabbi or the means of the rabbi. He wants you to be who you should be. That's all Hashem wants. That's what Hashem wants with you. So there's no greater simcha than successfully exploiting your own talents to succeed in Torah. That, 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 that's what it happens. It's very interesting. The Gemara brings a story. We'll conclude with this. The Gemara in Tainus says that a person by the name Rav Moni would usually learn Torah in front of Rav Yitzhak ben el Yoshif. So one time Rav Money was complaining. He says, listen, I have my, my, my wife's, my in-laws are very rich and they make a lot of problems with me. So can you help me? So Rav Yisrael, he davened that they should lose their money. And it happened. They became poor. Oh. A little while later, Rav Money comes back and says, hey, now that they're poor, they're asking me for money. Did I have to give them parnasah? <laughs> so Rabbi Yitzhak Davin, they should become rich, and they became rich again. A little later, Rabbi Money turned and said, listen, my wife, you know, she's not so pretty. <laughs> so Rabbi Yitzhak, what's her name? Her name's Chana. He davened, Chana should become blue, beautiful. So Chana became beautiful. Then Rabbi Money came back to Rabbi Yitzhak, and said, so now she's so arrogant because she's so beautiful. She thinks she's better than me. <laughs> so Yitzchak Davin, that she shouldn't be so beautiful. Gemara continues and tells the other students who are learning Torah in front of Yitzchak Ben El Yashu. And they turned for him 
and asked for mercy that he should daven, that they should become very smart. And at this point, Rav said, I think I've given up on davening. You know why? Because Rav, Rav Yitzhak regretted the fact that he bothered Hashem to change nature, to make the rich man poor, and to make the ugly woman beautiful. Because you know what? It still will never make people happy. <laughs> and he then decided he's never going to pray to make these kinds of changes for people. And that's what Rav Yitzhak was saying. He was saying, you know what? Don't ask me to change who you are. Be who you are, but exploit who you are. Manifest who you are to the best. And how is that? Because the Pesach says, Pegude Hashem Mesam Chelev. The mitzvahs of the Torah. That's what really gives joy. Because the Torah connects you to Hashem and is able to transform you into a much higher being. And those who learn Torah really can be the happiest people in the world. And We'll just end the Vilna Goni sent a letter to his wife and children. And he says, you know what this world is like? This world is like drinking salt water. When you're drinking it right away, it seems to be satiated. But what does it do? It just makes you more hungry, more thirsty. So that's the second point. We didn't do everything, but I think these are, are two critical points to realize how much we should really love Hashem. There's so much to love Hashem about as we said in the first part. And the second point is the real joy comes in, 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 in filling in what you're missing by connecting with the opposite and to connect with the infinite reality of Hashem, which is through learning Torah. And just by learning Torah, if you really try it, you know, honestly, with, with this corona, you know, in the last, I don't know how long it's been already, I think three months already, you know, it was, I decided because of the internet issues in my house, I decided to, to put up shop in the shul. I'm infinitely happier. <laughs> not that I don't love my wife, not that I don't love any of my grandchildren around me, but I'm not only thinking about this. That's it. it you just, you just, if you could just spend time just with Torah, it's a tremendous way of connecting yourself and being able to share the Torah with other people. This is the happiest time of the day. And notwithstanding all the other challenges, all the other things that we think would make us happy, but none of those other things that people say make you happy will. There's still more to talk about this. I don't know if we're going to do it, but next week, I think, would you rather have more about simple or more about the Megillah? What? I don't mind. What you don't you mind? Whatever you decide. What? Whatever you decide. About. Yeah. What do you say? Megillah. Megillah. Okay. So we'll try to uh, fit the Megillah into the theme. We'll try to do both. Okay, Shkayach, everybody, it's 9.15. We got to stop it.